I'm Patrick Toa from ETH Zurich, and this presentation is on public key generation with verifiable randomness. It is based on joint work with Olivier Blasi and Damien Vernier. Every crypto system starts with specifying the key generation algorithm, and is usually assumed that it has access to perfect randomness. But in practice, true randomness is rare, and one may only have access to very few truly random bits. This gap between theory and practice can have serious consequences on the concrete security of schemes. For example, Lance Royale did a sanity check in 2012 and found that a substantial amount of RSA moduli on the internet share common primes. It means that if the key owners were to realize that, they could sign messages on behalf of others. Henning Jerry et al. later identified the cause as the low entropy at boot time when keys were generated. Other consequences of randomness failure in practice were demonstrated by Nemec et al, who used Coppersmith's method to efficiently recover private keys from RSA public ones, because flawed implementations only selected specific primes instead of uniformly random ones. Those were the so-called Roker attacks, and several reworld certified devices were shown to be vulnerable. Jules and Guajardo already considered the PKC 2002 this problem of randomness failure in the generation of asymmetric keys. They introduced an authority here, Bob on the right, that is in charge of providing the user, Alice on the left, with extra randomness so that they can together generate keys that are close to uniform, and Bob should of course only learn the public key. The model even considered adversarial sources of randomness. Please note that the goal is here to guarantee to the end user, the human, that her keys were generated with high entropy randomness, and that her potentially flawed implementation has not weakened the key generation procedure and leaked information about her secret key, be it intentionally or not. Of course, the computer could leak the secret key in other ways, but Bob would only certify keys that he knows to have been generated with high entropy randomness. The first requirement of such a protocol is that if Alice has access to high entropy randomness, then even Bob should not have any information about her secret key. The second is that if Alice or Bob has access to high entropy randomness, then no adversary other than Bob can infer inform more information about the resulting key that it would have uh, about the resulting secret key than it would have if the key were generated according to the specified key generation algorithm. The last one is that if Bob has access to high entropy randomness, then Alice's computer cannot influence the generation of the keys and potentially leak information via the public keys, meaning that it cannot use the public keys as cover channels. In this sense, Bob ensures Alice, the human, that she can securely use her keys. And the Roker attacks precisely exploited the information leaked via public keys to efficiently recover the private keys. On the other hand, Jules and Guajardo, pro Jules and Guajardo protocol for RSA keys did not exactly guarantee the third property, as log lambda bit capacity cover channels were still possible, which may actually pave the way for other attacks. In addition to that, the model did not consider multiple sessions that could share correlated randomness even though it's precisely what was the cause of the vulnerabilities highlighted by Lenstrad et al. To understand the difficulty of the problem, consider the simple case of generated discrete log keys in a group of prime order P. The natural idea would be to have Bob send his randomness XP to Alice, and Alice would simply compute the secret key as XB plus a randomness XA modulo P. Alice would then compute and send back the public key Y as G to the X, and she would also prove to Bob that she knows the other part of the secret key, and then Bob would simply verify the proof. The issue with this approach is that Alice could pick a specific value for the secret key after seeing Bob's value, and this would violate the third requirement. Another idea, another idea could then to have Alice first commit to a randomness before Bob sends XP, and then in the proof, Alice would also show that the other part of the secret key is what was committed in the first round. 
But now the problem is that the properties of commitment schemes and zero-knowledge proofs are only guaranteed with perfect randomness. And all these donors have access to it in this more realistic model. This is, by the way, an aspect that was overlooked in Jules and Quadrato's protocols. It then turns out that a simple that the case of discrete lock keys is actually not as simple as one might expect. Our first contribution is a new model for this problem, uh, which considers multiple sessions and adversarial sources of randomness. The adversary is two-stage, and the role of the first one is to provide randomness to the parties. It can impersonate either of them during multiple concurrent sessions, eavesdrops on the, commu eavesdrop on the communication, and even change the messages sent by the parties. Then at the end of the game, the second adversary must distinguish the public key generation generated in one of these sessions from a key generated with a key generation algorithm on uniform randomness. It should be stressed that the two adversaries can only agree on a common strategy at the beginning of the game and cannot communicate afterwards. The reason is that in the protocol, Alice would have to prove in some way that she involved Bob's randomness in the generation of the key in the process. And this proof could then be used to leak information about the secret key. And then the first adversary could use this to send some information to the second. Alice could, for instance, restart the proof until the first three bits of the proof match those of the secret key. And nothing can be done about this. And it is a minimal requirement uh, to prevent communication if one wants to suppress subliminal channels or cover channels. This technical restriction could correspond to the fact that in practice, an engineer which implements a faulty algorithm for Alice may not necessarily also be able to eavesdrop on her, on, on her communication later on with Bob. It is also the reason why our model is not in the UC framework and does not guarantee composition, since uh, one would then have to consider local adversaries for the same reason, and it would then have changed the target of the paper. Another important observation is that Alice can in any case halt the protocol and restart if the public key doesn't match a certain pattern, for instance, if the key does not start with three zero bits. In other words, she would do a form of rejection sampling. Nothing can be done about this, and it is on the only narrow band subliminal channel that is allowed by the model. This could in, in practice be prevented by having Bob charge Alice for key generation or raise a complaint if there are too many requests in a short period of time. Now that the model has been established, consider again the problem of discrete lock keys. The idea is now to have Alice uh, extract two random strings from her original one. One that will be her partial secret key XA prime, and the other that will be used to commit to the first part, to XA prime. The commitment scheme must here be extractable to be able to carry out the security proof. After Alice receives Bob's randomness, she extracts a secret key X from, the, from these sources of randomness. She then, um, and computes also then Y as G to the X. She then proves to Bob that she extracted the secret key using Bob's randomness, and that the one she committed to in the first round, and uh, sorry, she proves to Bob that she extracted the secret key from Bob's randomness, and the one she committed to in the first round. And Bob can then verify the proof using the commitment from the first round. A caveat is here that deterministic extractors for all sources do not exist. So one must either use a random oracle or universal computational extractors in the plane model. On the positive side, this idea for discrete lock keys can be generalized to all key generation algorithms that can be modeled as, uh, that can be modeled as probabilistic circuits with no other restriction. But it does not apply to factoring based keys, which are still widely used in practice. So the goal is now to construct an efficient protocol for RSA keys. The NIST standard for RSA key generation is first choose at random two distinct large primes P and Q, compute N as PQ and phi of N, 
then choose e larger than 2 to the 16, that is co-primary phi of n, and then compute d as the inverse of e modulo phi of n. Set then the public key as any and the secret key as the factorization of n. But there is some ambiguity in this specification. The first is what is meant by large. Our interpretation is that there is a parameter b that fixes the length of p and q. The second is that there is an algorithm prime test which runs uh, a potentially randomized primary test algorithm on p and q and also checks that e which is usually fixed so like 2 to the 16 plus 1 is co-prime with phi of n. The third is that p and q may be required to satisfy additional properties such as being safe primes or equal to 3 modulo 4. The last one, and an important one, is that P and Q are really the first two primes that satisfy the required conditions, so that specific ones uh, cannot have been selected, as it was for the case uh, with the Roker attacks, and the generation of the public key can then not be biased. The protocol is, uh, is as follows. First, Alice extracts a randomness array prime as before and the randomness row A to commit to array prime. She then sends the commitment to Bob and Bob replies with his randomness RB. Alice then extracts the seed S uh, from her randomness and Bob's and runs a PRF encounter mode on it until she finds the first two primes that satisfy the, con the conditions. She then computes a proof that n is the product of two integers uh, returned by the PRF on seed S that were accepted by the prime test algorithm and are of the appropriate length. She also proves that the values that did not match the condition uh, were returned by the PRF on seed S. Um, she then sends the modulus n the and the exponent e, the index i of p, the values uh, other, than, other than p and q, and the proof. Bob first verifies the proof, uh, first verifies that the proof is correct, including the part that the other values sent by Alice were indeed returned by the PRF on seed s, and of course that this seed uh, was extracted using Bob's randomness analysis, and then also he later verifies that none of the other values, AK, passed the prime test algorithm. This is crucial to ensure that P and Q were really the first two primes that Alice found that passed, uh, that passed the test, and Bob can then be convinced that uh, Alice, or rather her computer, did not bias the key generation process. As mentioned before, prime tests may be randomized, and the proof uh, also requires some randomness. But the necessary randomness is extracted from the original randomness, and these non important details were omitted just to ease the presentation. The instantiation involves a group of public prime order P and Pedersen schemes to, collist, to commit to Alice's randomness. To, to extract a seed S, Alice hashes Bob's randomness and adds it to her modulo, uh, to hers modulo a sufficient amount prime L. This prime L must divide the order of G minus 1. The reason is that the PRF used to generate primes is the dodis yampovsky PRF in the group of quadratic residues modulo 2L plus 1 and uh, with a base A. Since P and Q are generated in G, the order L of A must then divide uh, order of G minus 1, as A generates a subgroup of Z order of G, Z order of G star. Uh, order of G must also be larger than 2L plus 1 square, to be sure that N is really the product of P and Q as integers, and that there was no modular reduction. In the proof of correct computation, Alice commits to P and Q with again Pedersen scheme in G, and since she must prove that these committed values are the output uh, are the outputs are outputs of the PRF on the seed S, she she essentially has to prove that she knows a value x such that a va public value y is equal to 
g to the a to the x, or in other words, a double discrete logarithm. This problem was introduced by Stadler in, 19, uh, in 1997 uh, to build ver a verifiable secret sharing scheme, and it was later used to build group signatures, electronic cash, credential systems, so it has a wide range of applications. The only, known methods, the only method known so far to prove knowledge of uh, double discrete logs is due to Kamenich and Stadler, and it has a communication complexity of the order of log of the group order because it uses 0, 1 as challenges. Using bullet proofs for arithmetic circuits, we managed to get a communication complexity of the order of log log of the group order. The difficulty is now to encode this problem as a circuit and make it suitable for bullet proofs. The method I'm about to present is different from the one in the paper, as it's easier to explain. It's actually closely related to the one on uh, presented in the paper on the Fontaine satisfiability arguments, also published at this uh, Intercrypt edition. The first step is to consider the binary decomposition of X. Then AX can be written as the product of AI values with AI either equal to 1 or A to the 2 to the I. This implies that y is equal to g to the product of the ais, so proving knowledge of a double discrete log of y amounts to proving knowledge of such ais. To enforce that ax, the d log of y, must be the product of uh, the ais, consider a polynomial uh, over the integers ax minus the product of the ais. It must then evaluate to zero. Now to impose that the AIs must be I, that AI must be either one or a to the two to the i, add those terms and raise every term to in the sum to the power two since the sum of squares is zero if only if each of the if each of the squares is. Now introduce variables bi with b zero as a zero and then add the AIs one by one and store in, and store the problem in bi. To again impose these relations, introduce uh, these additional terms in the polynomial. The last step is now to introduce variables ui and vi to avoid the cross terms in the product of ai minus 1 by ai minus a to the 2 to the i. And embed these relations in the polynomial again. The polynomial is now in an interesting form as the value ax is the one that is committed in y. There are also uh, li uh, linear terms which appeared here since UI and VI were introduced. From the rest, one can infer uh, product relations with, for instance, BI is equal to AI times BI minus 1. And the variables in blue can be interpreted as left inputs, the ones in red as right inputs, and the green variables as the outputs of the multiplication gates of a circuit. And these inputs additionally satisfy linear constraints represented by matrices W, by the w matrices. And these constraints guarantee uh, consistency between any two depth levels of the circuit. Beside AX is committed in the public value Y, as mentioned before. From this polynomial equation of, over Z, one can then infer over Z mod the order of G, the Hadamard product and linear consistency constraints and bullet proofs can then be used uh, to argue knowledge of uh, such inputs, AL, AR, and the outputs, AO. Uh, AO. That's how we managed to exponentially reduce the communication complexity of proofs of double discrete logs by using bullet proofs. There are certain questions that remain open. The first is whether Bob's randomness could be used to amplify analysis instead of requiring uh, in the model that either of them must have high entropy randomness. It's not clear whether it would be sufficient to have both of them to have access to, moder to moderately high entropy randomness, and then use these two to amplify the randomness to, to generate the resulting key. The second problem is to give a model in which entropy is accumulated over time is actually done in practice instead of assuming that it's providing in a single chunk. 
it would also be more realistic to have a model in which the randomness sources are not independent of the extractors, as the randomness sources are in practice timing interrupts and the extractors hash functions, and these two are then obviously correlated and not independent. These problematics were already considered by Coretti et al. at Crypto 2019 in the context of PRGs, and it would be interesting to see if it applies in the context of practical key generation. That's it for this presentation. Thank you for your attention, and please send us an email if you have any questions.